So, please enjoy this extra, extra long episode. <laughs> Nosferatu is a spine-tingling novel of supernatural suspense from Master of Horror Joe Hill, the New York Times bestselling author of Heart Shaped Box and Horns. Victorian McQueen has a secret gift for finding things, a misplaced bracelet, a missing photograph, answers to unanswerable questions. On her really tough burner bike, she makes her way to a rickety covered bridge that within moments takes her to wherever she needs to go, wherever it is across Massachusetts or across the country. Charles Talent Mannix has a way with children. He likes to take them for rides in his 1938 Rolls Royce Wrath with Nosferatu vanity plates. With his old car, he can slip right out of everyday world and into the hidden roads that transport them to the astonishing and terrifying playgrounds of the amusements he calls Christmas Land. Then one day, Vic goes looking for trouble and finds Mannix. That was a lifetime ago. Now Vic, the only kid ever to escape Mannix's unmitigated evil, is all grown up and desperate to forget. But Charlie Mannix never stopped thinking about Victoria McQueen, and he's on the road again, and he's picked up a new passenger, Vic's own son. Cool. So. Holy hell. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long book. A lot happens. Yeah. So then we get a massive time jump, and the story is in 2008 now? Uh, mine says 2000 to 2012. Um... So mine, I think some of your order actually is a little bit different from mine because one of the sections you mentioned earlier was in a different order. So what I've got is uh, it starts talking about when she is living in Colorado and she gets a phone call from the ghost children. Uh, she has a child also. Yeah, uh, so that yes, that's kind of what I what I'm getting to is that she stayed okay. with Lou and had his baby, but like not yes. right away either. She, they were together for a while. Yeah. But, like, Lou is three years older than her, four years older than her. He, he was 21. as He he was the one who effectively rescued her um, because he stopped to, like, pick her up and, you know, take her to her. And not leave her for dead. Yes. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so she's had his baby. Their relationship is kind of... It's hit and miss, I'd say. She loves him, but she doesn't have any therapy and therefore doesn't really know how to express that or why she gets, like, antsy and anxiety-driven and she's not dealing with her PTSD. She can't do- yeah. hold down a job, doesn't go to college. Um, Starts making books, though. Yeah! So she she also can she also worked in the motorcycle shop. So the her stages of career went. She did the decals for the motorcycles. She helped restore motorcycles, and then she started writing a successful series of like children's puzzle books. Yeah. Um, yeah, not quite a Where's Waldo, but like similar ish. Yeah, things that you kind of can't be too. It sounds like to create. Yeah, and I think part of it is, like, it works for her because it's, like, a non-linear storytelling in that a lot of them are puzzles and you have to, like, fold pages and move things around and her brain is kind of pretty scattered and she doesn't have to... There's no logical trajectory of the stories and I think that affects kind of, like, where her head is at and her mindset, which is that she can't follow logical steps or logical process. But it works really well as a child's book or a children's book um, because it it teaches kids to think outside the box. And, like, I think what they mentioned that one of the pages you actually have to, like, tear out of the book and roll into a circle to get the answer. Yes. No? Uh, yes? Um, sorry, I have the book flipped open, and I'm realizing that, like, it, it, it mentions that the first time that she, in, in a roundabout way, it's like the first time that she gets the phone call from the children, it just is 9-11. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, these children caused 9-11? This is a weird conspiracy theory. I think that it's probably because she then tries to follow up with 9-1-1, right? And that they're just unindated with calls. 
I think that's the significance of that. So that like she doesn't, it doesn't immediately get recognized as a problem because it was like written off with all of the other things that were happening. Yeah, that. Yes. Or at least that was my take on it. No, that makes that makes a lot more sense than my conspiracy theory that uh, dead zombie children who aren't dead caused 9-11. Vampire zombie children. In Please. Specifically in this universe. Mm. Right, that aside. Um, so she starts actually drawing the books to avoid the calls because the calls don't come if she's concentrating, which kind of gives you an indication that the calls are in her head. Yeah, um, and she, even in the first time it happens, she I think she says something about, like, uh, hey, do you guys hear the phone going off? And everyone's like, no, what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, so she knows it's not in this universe real, but it's real to her, um, which is fucking with her psyche. Yeah. Um, so the books give her an opportunity that she's never had before because now they have a lot of money because they're very successful. Which means that she gets taken to L.A. She leaves Lou. She heads off to L.A. Or she takes it Lou with him. Anyway, she burns down their house. So I'm not 100% sure how that happens. But um, Yeah, she tries to burn down all of... I think it was like Lou was going to do something else or maybe leaving. Uh, yeah, he takes Bruce, which is the baby's name. And um, it's not a baby. Bruce Wayne. I don't, Bruce Wayne. She takes, I, he takes Batman, and then she takes all of the phones <laughs> in the house and, and throws puts them in, in the, the oven, oven, and then is surprised when the house catches fire. I don't think uh, she's necessarily she's surprised. Been in two burned. Yeah. Um. So she, she has talks to go about to later, rehab. Like she wasn't trying to burn the house down. I just don't think so. she's not surprised that the house burned. She didn't want to necessarily burn the house down, but she's also not surprised. Yes. Wow. I, uh, a hammer, would, a hammer and an out on fire would have achieved the same thing. Yeah. Well, she already tried to break about apart a bunch of phones. Yeah, but then you set them on fire outside. Fair. Um, so she ends up going into a psych unit. She also somehow, at some point in this period of time, gets access to cocaine and booze and also has to go to rehab because cocaine, heroin, and booze. Um, but she's... What? No, okay. no, sorry, I had nothing. Okay, sorry, you laughed at something else? I'm not funny enough for you? you you're getting, like, cute text messages from somebody? Who is she? Um... <laughs> no, she... Yeah. <laughs> Here's, here's plenty that, of dead air. This is where we can trim it down. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying out this whole second. Okay. So, she gets her shit together. She wants to be a part of Bruce's life. She's had therapy. She's, like, recognized a bunch of this stuff as being, like, psychosomatic. Um, she's got PTSD. She realizes she has to deal with her trauma. She is on the up and up. And she ends up getting out, uh, and moving in with her mom because her mom's dying. Um, so she, as part of her recovery, she's trying to, like, apologize and make amends for the life that she was living. And, um, part of that is, like, taking care of her mom as her, in her mom's final, um, months. Which is interesting because she keeps smoking despite the fact that she's on oxygen. Yeah. It's, it's um, part of I mean, they, they confront that right up. The mom doesn't care if everything explodes. Yeah, the mom doesn't care. And uh, Vic's a little bit nihilist as well, so. Maybe she wants to also die, but, like, not actively. There's a lot of that. 
Yeah, she's not seeking it out, but she's not like. At no point in this has she really been happy for any extended period of time. No, she she has lived a very sad life, and I think this is one of the points I got to where I was like, we're not getting any wins. I need some wins, please. It's everything is sad. Like, yeah, we got. Let's see, we got the. She goes to the house and meets the child, and then basically everything just is falling apart. Uh, I mean, everything was already falling apart, but the next couple hundred pages are just everything falling apart still. Yeah, and her realizing her dad was abusive and he used to wash his knuckles of blood off in the sink um, because he used to beat her mother, and her mother didn't care about the affairs that anything else that her dad was having, and so she never really forgives her dad and she realized that there was a lot going on in the house even before she got kidnapped. Um, so, yeah, I think she she's never really lived a happy life and she wants to die, but passively. Yeah. So then her mom dies um, and we end up getting some more Maggie uh she shows back up and this time is like hey actually go after Charlie and Hanks this time yeah (laughs) like be aware that he's alive at the very least because while she was institutionalized he apparently died and I say apparently because there is no corpse there's no corpse but also his heart was no longer in his chest or maybe they put it back I guess they put him back and stitched him out He'd, he'd been autopsied, but he also got up, took this guy's clothes, the security guy's clothes, and his gun, and left. Um, also a hammer. Also a hammer. Yeah, the brain hammer? I don't know. Cranial hammer? Something like that. The, the autopsy hammer. He just carries it around and uses that for the rest of the book. Yeah. Which is super convenient. Like, if he ditched that hammer and used a normal hammer, everybody would have said she was crazy. But, like, there's enough to go off with the hammer that she's... Everybody's like, um, well, I wish she'd stop saying that. Um, <laughs> It'd be much easier if, if we could just write this off, but uh, she is mentioning the hammer. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um... Cool, and I think it's at that point then we flash back to the guy who's, like, rebuilding the car. Uh, uh, sure, somewhere in here. So yeah. another guy re- rebuilds the car, uh, and then Charlie Nanx steals, comes back to life because the car has come back to life. Uh, and that's when his corpse disappears from the uh, morgue, or... Whatever. Yeah, the morgue at the hospital. And um, he... The car kidnapped... The car, independent of anyone else, kidnaps the guy driving it who restored it over a period of about 20 years. Like, this is a life project. Oh, not yes, quite. He's been working on this so that he could take his daughter to prom. Yeah, in a fancy a old car. Weird sentence. So that he could drive his daughter to prom. Sorry, so his daughter I could drive herself to prom. Well, she learned to drive in that car, but I feel like as part of the deal, you don't really want to drive yourself to prom, even if it is in a fancy car. Isn't the whole thing about, like, secretly getting drunk afterwards because you're all too young? Y- yes. <laughs> no? I don't know. That's not my thing. But the fancy car car, though. So you would take a fancy car to prom? I mean, he would drive a fancy car to prom. The fancy car. Sure. It's a pretty fancy car. It is a pretty swanky car. It's an old Rolls Royce. I mean. Yeah. It's pretty. Anyway, I did Google the car. Moving promptly along because this is taking so long. So long. Um, the car kidnaps the guy who restored it, takes it to Bing's house, 
Bing takes the guy and puts him in the land of sleep. Which I get stuck with, like, accidentally calling the land of Nod, but there are two completely different places and we should not confuse the two. Um, um, yes, carry on. <laughs> uh, so, Bing's back somehow. Bing and Charlie Max. Bing was just chilling, and now he's back. Yeah. He was Bing just, was like, just living. sad and chilling. And he had yeah. done nine of his ten, ten con- contract kidnappings. And he didn't get to go to the land, Christmas land. The land of Christmas. Yeah. Um, but he's also about to hit like thirty or forty years working on the job, on the in the same job that he's worked. Um, so he's and he doesn't he know what to do. He just went back to doing that. It's fine. Yeah, well, I don't think he ever stopped doing it. There was never a break yes, for him. Te- technically, he was doing it the whole time. He would just, you know, disappear for a couple of days. And they were fine with that because, like, 90% of the time, he's an excellent labor employee. He doesn't do anything. He's not... He's particularly benign and does a low menial job, a low-paying menial job. With no complaints. And he doesn't creep out too many people because he has a job where he only talks to other weird people. Yes. <sighs> okay. So, then Maggie shows up on Vic's mother's house's doorstep with a folder of information about the wrath and about Charlie Maddox and him not being dead. Um... Vic's like, uh, uh, this is a delusion, like, don't, don't bring this shit here, I'm doing okay now. And Maggie's like, I, whatever, and leaves, and leaves the folder. Um, and Vic's son finds the folder, and he starts to learn about Charlie Mannix, so. That's a thing that they never informed yeah, him he about. Yeah, he starts... He starts reading about that and this whole time his mom had been working on a uh, the bike that they had found. Um, she drives the bike away. He reads about the, the papers from the folder and then Bing comes up to the house and does a very bad job of trying to kidnap him but then does kidnap him. So I guess he did a good job anyway. Um, okay, I wasn't quite there yet. We missed that Bing killed the neighbors to spy on Vic. Bing did kill the neighbor. I, I left that part out. Uh, and then... So... Vic has enough money that she's rented this, like, getaway house by the lake. Um, and they take... She takes Bruce to the lake so that they don't have to stay in her dead mother's house all that much. Um... So, the yeah, then we get to the point where Charlie Mannix and Bing kidnap Wayne because Vic's taken the bike to the shorter way, effectively, and then freaked herself out and broken the bike in trying to stop so abruptly. So she's having to walk the bike home. Um... And in doing that, she can she hears uh, Mannix and Bing take Batman into the car, and she puts up one hell of a fight. Um, she's wearing Lou's motorcycle jacket and um, a helmet, so that she usually protects and her from. And she gets the crap beaten out of her. Absolute shit beaten out of her with this hammer, which is why it's so important that this. Autopsy hammer is around. Um, she like has been hit with it so many times she can identify the hammer, and ends up they end up starting to shoot at her, and she like dives in the lake, um, where she loses Lou's jacket and the helmet, and like hides under the barge for a bit, and as soon as they drive off, she calls the police. She calls nine one one. Because she's like, my son has been kidnapped? Yes. 
and this time they actually handle it. Oh, not yeah. handle it. They, like, acknowledge it is a better way of putting it. Yeah, there's no other, like, international crises happening, and therefore um, there's somebody available to respond um, to yes. her emergency call. So, um, Batman also, while he's in the car, while um, Vic is being attacked, calls his dad and says that he's being kidnapped and that it's Charlie Mannix specifically, having read about him in the files. Um, yeah, having, like, seen pictures of him. Yeah, and so he, like, calls it out to his dad, who's in the airport, having, like, dropped Batman off with with Vic. Um, and then he uh, has a TIA at this McDonald's. TIA? Uh, so it sounds like they were describing a heart attack, but then later on they say that he's got, like, transient ischemic attack, which is many strokes. Uh, okay. I still thought it was a heart attack, but that's maybe I wasn't paying enough attention. I was reading really fast at this I, so, point. So, like, I thought this first one was a heart attack, and then later on they're like, I had a TIA. And anyway. Okay. Not terribly important to anyone else. No. Well, I mean, he thinks he's going to die the whole time. Um, so the police arrive, and they're taking Vic's statement, and she's like, I'm going to tell these people the same story over and over and over again until the person arrives. The person, she's like, the guy, I think she's what she refers to. And then this chick turns up and she's like, this is the guy. And she's like trying to be really insistent about her story. And then she realizes that that woman is less of an investigator or a, a somebody who does kidnapping negotiations. And she's actually a psychologist. And she's yeah. like, oh. oh, okay, so they don't believe me. They think I've killed my own son. Yes, and they, like, just spent some time talking about that. Um. Yeah, so... Um, I, think, I think this is the part, yeah. When this, um, Around this part is the first time that they talk about... He, he makes, like, a couple of references in this to... Um, some other works of his and his father's and this is the first part where he mentions the treehouse of the mind which is like the same inscape concept except it's uh, from horns oh okay so i thought that was super neat but like oh, i didn't get that made. reference so yeah because there's also uh, just have... like what i think is some gibberish like orphan henge Maybe that's coming up in future books. Who knows? Maybe it's just in a book I haven't read. Possibly. But I'm not sure how much I trust your um, recommendations these days. Check out Horns. It's a good book. You've actually read this one? So maybe. Yes. <laughs> okay. So... Um, so she manages to call, she looks at a book of hammers and calls out the specific type of autopsy hammer, which is the only, like, detail in the story that doesn't line up with her murdering her own son. Because where the fuck would she get one of those? Um, the, the, they're still highly suspicious that Vic has done it, even up till the point where um, Lou shows up and he's like, like, have we done anything about the kidnapping? And they're like, how do you know? And he was like, Wayne called me from the, or Batman called me from the car. Um, so, um, yeah, then, so they're like, oh, he has his phone on him. And they like trace the phone call that reveals his location on that. Like, I don't understand how the GPS works in this, but um, they actually get like a ping from his phone. That's at Christmas Land, on a map of the U a distorted United States on a weird global map. Yeah, and that map, um, that map shows uh, like 
America is really crunched up so that like the Northeast is more important. There's a highway that cuts across to Colorado, which is where Christmas land is. Um, it has the house of sleep on it. It has like the, the graveyard of what might be. So these are all along this, like uh, the St. Nick Parkway. And then it also has pin drops for orphan henge and the tree house of the mind and Pennywise circus and the Lovecraft keyhole. So a lot of references to like his other stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, somehow the GPS tracks him into this nonsense land. Yeah, which is great, because despite all of that, they still don't believe her story. Actually, I'm like, yeah, they're like, this oh, this is, is some pretty... weird stuff that's very consistent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, seriously? I was a little bit flummoxed by the fact that they had, like, actual evidence at that point of his location and, like, him being alive and moving. Like, minimum, he's alive. At, like, the phone is still on, and it's moving, and it's moving away. Like... That, to me, indicates that, like, he's not dead yet. Like, because if you're going to ditch a phone, it's going to be in one place. Anyway. Anyway, so Vic is in protective custody in to say that she's under house arrest. Um, but she escapes and goes to the bike, which now is, like, broke her. The rear brakes are broken. Um, takes the bike and goes on the shorter way to find Batman. Um, but instead of, like, turning up where, um, Batman is, she ends up at Bing's house. Um, which turns out to be the land of sleep. So he's been keeping the mothers, normally, of the children that is kidnapped. Sometimes the fathers. Sometimes the fathers. But they're not really his style. He makes a point of, of saying that the, um... The man that arrived to his house in the rack, he was like, I mean, he sucks dick just as well as all of the women, but it's not really my flavor. Um, yeah, this is this is where it's like explicitly made clear that he's just like raping everyone all the time. Yeah, and that the most of the people are buried in the basement floor. Um. Yeah, and so it. Like, as you said before, like, Bing's point of view... Sorry, we left out that the dog got killed. We just glossed over the fact that the dog got killed. Yeah, so... That was, was the like, one of the other parts of this book where I was like, that could have just not happened, I think. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like, all of this is very bad, but, like, at least it's bad in a kind of a consistent way. Yeah, the dog was a little bit OTT. I think I just kind of blocked it out because I didn't want to read about dog death. It's too close to home. This this section was all very hard with, like, kids getting kidnapped, which is kind of consistent with what's going on, but then the dog gets killed and the bit with the raping, and could we maybe not? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a lot. Um, and also, like, uh, as you were saying before, like, being this point of view is like we'd been we, we went to bing's house uh in the wrath like we stopped over at the land of sleep to deposit bing because bing royally fucked up by not getting rid of victoria um so he doesn't get to go he's ruined everything so he doesn't get to go to christmas land to christmas and land he gets he chucks a hissy fit and um runs after the wrath um, as Charlie Mannix is, like, pulling away with Batman in the car. Um, I think that's not long b- before, like, Vic actually shows up by the shorter way. I think it, it can't have been too long because he's still, like, standing yeah, out in the like, yard. Yeah. It's, it's not a terrible not a terribly long time before she shows up and uh, he tries to murder and rape her. And then we get to start finally having some, you know, positive stuff happen when she uh, explodes everything and burns down her third house. (laughs) It's a bit of a theme there. I hadn't caught on to the house burning down theme. 
technically, I guess she didn't burn the first one. She was just in it while it caught fire. But well, that's what set her off, right? It's what's what's triggered this desire to burn down houses. She has to burn everything and save her son. Yeah. Coming this summer. <laughs> I I might have watched that film recently. There's been a lot of those kind of films out on Netflix. Um. <laughs> Huh. Okay, so Bing's house, self defense. Um, Vic calls Lou, and he she realizes that the phone is being tapped, and that they probably know that Maggie called the house, or she called Maggie, right, the other day mm-hmm. when she when she was there. We also understand now that there's been a bit of a time jump. There's been a time lag using the shorter way. So it wasn't so much instantaneous. She's actually been gone a couple hours. Like, more so than just the hour or so she was trapped in the basement. But not like, yeah. But still enough that she could not have possibly gotten to where she was by driving. Yes. Um, and I think most, so probably most of our time lag has been that because she was passed out in the basement for a bit. Um, because he hit her on the head, didn't he? Yes. And they like yeah, came down was... to gas her. Um. So the I think we should mention that the um the happy gas is it just makes everybody really suggestible, and it removes your sense of pain. So he part of this is like a fair amount of manipulation. Not overtly, because he's not smart enough to do it, and he doesn't have the capacity to do it, but he knows that he can convince these people under the gas that they love him and to do the things that he wants to do to them, which is um, mostly sex-based, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, he just has a lot of this gas from at work he's just collected it over the years and his intention is to gas Victoria until she's pliant enough but she never makes it that they never make it that far before he exploits the house anyway she calls Lou um, and gives a somewhat coded message which the FBI misinterpret um, where Lou is to go to her father's and she's going to get explosives because her father used to be involved or still is involved in demolition work, or he, yeah. She, um, he knows about, down, yeah. He's, he was he did a lot of demolition stuff. He knows how to break an explosive. So she, she tells him to go, she tells Lou to go meet her, her at her father's house. Yeah. So, so they can blow while, stuff up. Yeah. So the police head off to, um... Bing's house, they're also putting people at Maggie's place, um, which is where Vic's headed next. So she heads to Maggie's library to um, basically get more information, effectively. Um, And so the... Ow, my body hurts. Cool. So she heads to Maggie's, where she meets up with Maggie, who's, like, really gone off the deep end with the drug use Her- and... Heroin addiction? Yeah, heroin addiction S- and... Scrabble addiction? Scrabble addiction and just cutting in general. Um, so she goes to see Maggie. She gets a cup of tea. They're, Vic's pretty beat up, um, so Maggie shares as her oxy, the last of her oxy supply with um, Vic, and then they have a snuggle on the couch, which is the first and only time, I think, that Maggie has been ever held while she goes to sleep, which I thought was just, like, a heartbreaking line. Um, Yeah. Maggie's whole thing is a very sad experience and we only spend like that very brief time with her in the beginning, that very brief time in the middle. And then this like last March towards her death. That is like 
for sure coming the entire time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, Maggie wakes. Um, Vic's still out because of the oxy. And um, she can hear um, a car in, in the library, in the top of the library. So she heads off. And she sees a little boy who has fireworks, and she pretty much immediately recognizes it, recognizes it as Batman. Um, because Batman let it slip that Maggie had tried to visit Vic before, and she knew all about um, Charlie Mannix. Um, yeah, Charlie like pieces together that this is probably where uh, Vic has gone to or will be going to. Yeah, and I think he. Or wants actually, to... does he does he figure that out? Or I guess he's really only there because Maggie exists and he doesn't want her to anymore. Yeah, I think there's that. He doesn't want her to give away information about him because she's not respecting the code of all the rest of the serial killer people who are doing what he's doing. Which is referenced a couple of times that there are like people crisscrossing the United States and they all stay out of each other's way. Yeah, I know. I, I caught at least one of those. But yeah, so there's a couple of murderers doing their murder things. Mm. So she's not. Maggie's not respecting the rules. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry. Previous to this, I should mention that Maggie got up to ask the tiles about uh, Vic's question. But um, because of her stutter, the tiles also stutter, and she couldn't get a clean, a clean message from them. So she goes through like a ritualistic process of, of, of self-harm to generate an appropriate uh, response to... Uh, Vic's question, which she finds later. Um, and she, like, yeah, cries and it, like, about it. It comes out as, like, gibberish to Maggie, but she knows that it's significant. Yeah. and But Maggie's been crying the whole time, or, like, all over the letter. <clears throat> and I don't know if part of that's the pain or the knowledge about what's ha- happening next. So, um... Flashback to what I was talking about before, which is uh, Maggie encountering Bruce. And Bruce is starting to go cold and a little bit weird. And he... Um... Yeah. Hmm? So, so prior to this, we've um, gotten some chapters or sections where you're seeing... Uh, I'll call him Wayne, I get Batman. Where we get Batman's perspective on all of this um, and sort of his, his journey in the car with... Manx. And we find out that when he's in the Wraith, he can't get into the front seat. Uh, the Wraith can, like, make things disappear. Um, it takes his phone. It takes his phone. It, like, makes uh, Christmas ornaments appear. And uh, it can act on its own, basically. Um, yeah. And then I think where exactly we find that out is not important, but somewhere in one of those sections we find out that it's like an extension of Charlie's mind. It's in they they use the word inscape. So like Charlie can control it with his mind. And yeah, he knows and everything that's like inside of it. True. And it doesn't necessarily seem to be active thought either. It's like passively connected to his intentions to a large extent as well. So he doesn't need to be like Yeah, he doesn't have to be focused on it. Yeah. Um, which I thought was pretty, it's pretty nifty, like, if you're suffering a huge amount of blood loss because somebody cut off your ear and you've been stabbed, to have the car drive away for you, that's always exciting. Yeah, to have the car drive on its own is, like, cool on its own, sort of regardless of why it's happening. Yeah, circumstances aside. Um, yeah, so... We've also, is it worth mentioning and, the grandmother, or is that going to be a bit much? Yeah, so I also wanted to say, the, the whole section, the, the, other, the other part of that, aside from learning about Manx and the Wraith, is we get to, this is our first 
uh, prolonged exposure to like one of the children going through like I'll call it the madness process, but whatever we want to refer to it as. The change. And we get to see how. Yeah, puberty, I think. Um, <laughs> or anti-puberty, because he doesn't ever age again, is how this would work. Crystallization? Anyway, we... There we go. Um, the vampirization process. We... The, the, the bloodletting process, I guess. Oh, yeah, fair, fair. Um, we get to see in this, like, how he's gradually losing his mind, and also it characterizes, like, the way in which they lose their mind, where before we're, like, exposed to, like, that kid who seems to have been brainwashed, and here we find out that it's actually, they lose their ability to think things through, basically, so they become driven by what they think is going to be fun or funny. Yeah, instant gratification kind of thing for fun and funny, and that they're not... That their humor isn't necessarily, like, slapstick comedy style or British witticisms. It's like, oh, stabbing people is fun. Yeah, it's, it's like, ah, her eye probably would be pretty cool to hold in my hand. I'm gonna go take her eye out. Is a very, like, clean example of what their thought process is. So he, like, dismembers a butterfly and then uh, later has, like, a brief moment of clarity where he's like, oh, that wasn't great. No, and he and he, me- getting... he meets his grandmother. Yeah, yeah he's getting... Um, by, um... Thinking backwards, which I thought was interesting, but also like yeah. You've started breaking up. Oh, sorry. Uh, from what point? Uh, about like twenty seconds. Okay, well, it's Grandma Lynn. He. She's trying to, like, get the process to slow down for Batman, and he, um, she's trying to encourage him to think backwards, and she, like, immediately starts talking backwards to him, trying to get him to think backwards so that he can, like, hold on to it, because it's in the, like, a logical but not necessarily overtly logical way of holding on to himself. Yeah. Uh, it's like because it's like deliberate thinking or something like that. Yeah. Do we do we get any explanation about why the grandmother even appears? Um, I think. Or does that just sort of happen? We don't really get an explanation, and I think you could like look at it either as Linda, who spent her whole life not being able to protect her own daughter from the tragedies that she went through, like. This is her, like, call to action to save her grandson. Or that, like... So she's grandma... a spooky ghost. Yeah, she's a spooky ghost. Or that it's an empty hole in uh, Batman's life. His brain. Oh. Yeah, like, like he, has a, he has a space for her. But he never really knew her. So she, as a visual, makes a great catalyst for being an old wise woman to like advise him on how to stay alive. Okay. I like the spooky ghost theory. Spooky ghost theory is good. I like it that her colder action is after she died. <laughs> it's the <laughs> it's the traditional uh what's it called? The hero's journey. Yeah. There's, you have to die first. There's though. like the ten there's the ten steps and then you die and then there's like four more steps and then the call to action. Yeah, basically. So, okay, uh, let's keep keep on keeping on because this is going to be a lot of work for me. <laughs> my apologies. No, it's fine. I love a good chat. Um, clearly, I made a podcast and recorded me just having a chat all the time. Um, cool. So, Maggie in the library. 
with the autopsy hammer. <laughs> Basically. So We're playing Clue. Yeah. <laughs> That's what this whole book Sorry, is Cluedo. about. Cluedo, yeah. Okay. I mean, the movie is Clue, isn't it? The mo- Well, so in America, they're all Clue. Everything is Clue. Really? That's interesting. Why? The, the game is called Clue uh, here, and now we've got plenty more that can be just sort of snipped out of this. <laughs> <laughs> America's a weird place. That's probably why this weird British place. guy said his story there. Um, cool. So, um... Mannix runs over Maggie with his car and then proceeds to beat her to death with a hammer. Vic wakes up when the police arrive. And they're searching through the library because they found another dead junkie. Um, and also because they think that's where Vic will be. Um, they think that Vic probably killed her with the hammer in the library. And um, we get kind of like an interaction between her and the police where they think that they don't really know who she is, but they don't draw their guns or anything. Strange. It's America. Um, this is, yeah, hold on. I thought this book was set in America. This is where the That's biggest indication that the here. author is not American. <laughs> um, so if, she... They would have shot, shot the building up like four or five times before even going in. <laughs> Just to check. That the building was dead. <laughs> Just in case. Cool. Um, yeah, so interaction <laughs> between her and the police. She recalls um, Maggie telling her that if the lights go out in the library for any reason or she gets trapped there, that she should always take the left-hand turn. Is that right? Always go uh, left and she'll find a way out? Left, right. It's one of those. Um, she yeah. told her that like 20 years ago is the significance. But yeah. Yes, she has. And this she just she does it and she escapes. Yeah, she like knocks the policeman's torch off out of his hand and it turns off and they're like fumbling around in the dark and she's like, oh, gotta make time and space, but my knee is fucked. So she grabs one of the items off the floor and like pings it off to in the other direction and they go chasing after the noise like in every movie ever um like in the last of us yeah yeah you throw then, bricks so that they, the zombies go after it cool you don't know they were um, policemen those could have been zombies they could have been zombies i mean we have vampires in this so there's not, uh, not yeah there's nothing telling you that that can't be maybe that's with, why the they logistics. were slow with the guns because the zombie like, responses are not great. Zombies can't have guns. That's against the rules. <laughs> I mean, they can. They just might not know how to use them. But also, okay. like... I'll concede that. Yeah. What is the series of movies with the zombies and and and... And then they just get ridiculous and there's that giant, giant zombie with a hammer. Uh, Night of the Living Dead? No, we're thinking like there's 12 movies out. I can't remember what they call Sharknado. It. That's not a zombie film. Sharknado 2? It's also a video game. <laughs> Resident Evil. Yes. In the, like, the fifth one, there's that giant zombie with a giant giant hammer that breaks down the wall. Anyway, it's fine. It's been I a have very limited exposure to that series. I've only played the first game, so... I have watched way too many of the films too many times. Well, they do sound very bad and about vampire-adjacent creatures, so... <laughs> <laughs> yes, but they're less fantasizing about these ones. Um, thank God. Um... <laughs> Moving probably along. So, Maggie's dead. Um, Moving slowly along. 
crawling away with vigor. Um, <laughs> Maggie is scared. I'm nev- we're never doing a book that's over, like, 200 pages again, because Trex and I already talk for, like, two hours on books that are, like, 200 pages. I, I think it just needs to be kept sort of on track or maybe on any sort of pace, because we spent a while on the first. The summary is 500 words. That... You... In my defense, I don't have much experience doing this. You and Trex are now professionals. No, we're not. We're not paid for it. We're just enthusiasts. Um. <sighs> cool. So, Maggie's dead. Victor's escaping. She gets on a bike and basically drives off to find the Shorterway Bridge. The Shorterway Bridge disappears. It makes a huge bang noise and sends out an EMP wave that kills all of the equipment the FBI have set up. Boom. On it. Plot points. Go there on. we go. She walks into the house. She talks to her dad. They're cool now, I guess. She talks to Lou. They're cool. Yeah, they were cool, cool the whole time. Oh. <laughs> yeah. They, they get the explosives. Lou says he's coming with them. They get on the bike. They go to the sleigh house. Mm-hmm. There we go. We processed a whole lot all at once. <laughs> so so very quickly. Um, the sleigh house, though, not Christmas land. Correct. So they get off yeah, the bike. They, yeah, take no? it. No, I no, mean, no, no, you were much more it. efficient than I was. Um, uh, she handcuffs Lou to a tree. It tells him that he can't come with her because he needs to be on the other side when she brings back the kid, Bat- brings back Batman, because he needs a father and she understands that he's had, like, a heart attack or mini strokes this whole time. And so she doesn't want to put him in under any extra stress. She also doesn't think she can take multiple people across the Shortway Bridge. And yeah, they do provide, like, just enough justification for it that you're only kind of angry that she does this. Yeah, only a little bit. Um, uh, I'm tired. And it's time for Christmas Land. They go to Christmas it's Land. Christmas Land. Well, she goes Davis to Christmas Land. No, they. Sorry. She, she, goes she, well, also, Charlie Manx goes to Christmas Land. Yeah, but that's been hit. That's where he's been, like, most of this time. Okay, fine. Batman goes to Christmas Land. Batman goes to Christmas Land. And they eat the sugar this episode. Snowflake. Batman goes to Christmas Land. Okay, I'll write that down. <laughs> you don't have to write that down. <laughs> no, it's on the list now. I'll use it as the secondary title. <laughs> Fantastic. Along with your um, photo. Of the dinosaurs? Mm-hmm. All very good. Very good stuff. Cool. cool. So, moving promptly along. Again, she's there. She's in the place where Batman is only a little bit vampiric and not 100% there. All of his teeth have fallen out, though. Because that's the thing. But she gets there right as they get there, and she realizes that there are so many children. There are many, There's many children. children. Like a lot of children. Large numbers like, of children. All of them in a tree. K I S S I N G. I mean, they're not. The but... Ferris wheel? No, all the dead the people are the Ferris wheel. It's okay. Um. Moving probably along. Just ignore that whole section, guys. <laughs> Moving <laughs> promptly along. What? You don't like my phrases? No, we're moving promptly along. Are we? I, feel I was like emphasizing we how promptly yeah. we're moving along. Crawling a little bit along. Um, so, Vic and. Mannix are having a showdown of sorts in that he's like, well, you're here in my space now. Good luck to you. And she's like, I have bombs. And he's like, good luck to you. (laughs) Actually, I've got explosives. We good. (laughs) Hand over the child. And he's like, well, you can have him if he wants to leave. Does he want to leave, though? That's a real question. 
The answer is he doesn't yeah, know. Yeah, kind of. That's only sort of. But they're gonna play Scissors for the Drifter. <sighs> Gotta play Scissors for the Drifter. I'm kind Sorry, of. Sorry, it's um I'm a little bit. Scissors for the Drifter, Scissors for the Bitch, uh, is what oh. the moon says during the section. Oh, that's right. The moon gets on board. The moon uh, starts screaming. <laughs> yeah. And then she starts blowing stuff up, and the moon starts screaming even more. Yeah, not having a great time. Um, lots of explosions, and none of the none of the dials on the explosive seem to be like really true about time. So five minutes is not quite five minutes in a lot of places. One of them's really short. But yeah, she she's does- playing a twist on Russian roulette where. Uh, <laughs> It is going to explode, just like the when? time is the is the roulette. Yeah, she also does drive past. And somehow she doesn't die just long enough for her to escape and then die. Oh, but she thinks her eyeball's going to explode and she loses an eardrum. I think. She definitely talks about things yeah. like oozing out of her face. Um. She also drives past the Ferris wheel, which is the bit that kind of like grossed me out the most, where she. Gives us a pretty detailed description of the other people that have come to Christmas Land and what their fates were. They're all kind of like hung up in bits as rag dolls, and I mean in bits because some of the children are wearing the other bits. Yeah, the kids like to play with the bits. Yeah, yeah. A... Well, at least nothing rots in Christmas Land. So they have the bodies forever. It's cold, so it's preserved. But yeah, but not so cold that you need to wear shoes or a jacket or even clothes. One of the kids is pretty much naked. (sighs) Anyway, things start exploding. Lots of explosions and the moon is screaming. Um, (laughs) Cut out the last 20 minutes. Just (laughs) there you go. (laughs) (laughs) I'll cut out some of it. Um... Moving slowly along. Um, So she manages to grab Batman and jumps on the bike and head out via the shorter way as things kind of explode behind them. Um, uh, We get to the other side and uh, I I don't think we get a lot after this because we basically get... um, That's kind of the end until like a year later and we have... Um, hang on a second. Hey. Thank you. Is it Wolfie? No. Thank you. It's my dad bringing me more coffee. But not bringing you Wolfie. No, he's not allowed in my bedroom. Ah. The sheer volume of dog hair is too high. (laughs) (sighs) Yes, so that's, um, we don't really get... Basically, she leaves, uh, she says, out of gas. And it's a metaphor for the fact that she's out of gas. Yeah. And then we get the, like, I guess epilogue is not an unfair word to use here. Um, follow up? Where we find out that... Hmm? Epilogue? It, yeah, it's not really an epilogue. It's, it's kind of like a follow-up. It's not or... really an epilogue, because we get an epilogue. And the epilogue is tucked inside of the acknowledgments. Oh, I missed it then. All right, cool. So you're going to have to or tell me inside of the note on the type? Oh, yes. I think... No. I don't know. Tell me all about it in a minute. So... Sure. Vic yeah. dies. So, trying one more time. Vic dies October now. Wayne, you got a little bit of, like, Wayne still having the weird thoughts where he's like, ooh, what if I just, like, cut this person? Yeah, he's struggling uh, and then, a lot with, um... Normalizing his emotions, but his parents put him into therapy and did all the right things about his traumatic experience. Good parenting. Yes. Cycle is broken. Yeah, he gets he gets a father. Here we go. Lou <laughs> lost a whole bunch of weight because he had gastric bypass surgery. He also had other surgery. Um, because he's had and the Lou is dating the FBI psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. And then they go, and it's ornament time. And yeah, this part so, is very good. 
Yeah, I like this too. Um, so Lou is like, oh, I have a job to do. You don't need to come because they're hiding the fact that she and uh, Lou are dating, but um, Batman's on top of the fact that she's over for breakfast all the time. Like Batman can sniff out crime and also that these two people are dating. Yes. Uh, they, the three of them go for a ride together. Uh, Batman's having some of the crazy thoughts, and then Lou realizes the thing that uh, Maggie had written with the Scrabble tiles for Vic to read uh, and decodes that it means that he needs to go to the sleigh house and destroy all of the Christmas ornaments to release the children from Christmas land. Yeah. And he does that, and they start to come back from Christmas land, and they're not demons. They're not demons, and they're the same age but that they, they went in. they are displaced in time. Yeah. They're the same yeah. age as they went in, so it's really weird. <sighs> yeah, I mean, some of these kids got kidnapped, like, a hundred years ago. 1928, he took his children there, didn't he? Uh, that sounds about right. So, whatever, 80 years ago. So some of these children are, like, also their own grandparents. <laughs> I mean, not exactly. That's not quite how that works, but... Yeah, but it's like, it's like a lot. But it gives um, Wayne a chance to, to, to come back to normal, basically. And he doesn't have any weird sensations about missing his pointy teeth. Yes. And they're going to skip Christmas this year. Yeah. And probably... If Santa tries to come down our chimney, I'll send him back up with my boot in his ass. It's a promise. <laughs> Fair enough. Good call. Good call. You can. There are other festivals you can have. There, or just any day presents is fine too. Yeah, I think he's probably gonna get like double birthday, double birthday I mean, no Christmas. Yeah, or like double down on Thanksgiving or Easter. It sounds like they're gonna spice up Fourth of July, which that's fair. Yeah, yeah. It's not Independence Day for the rest of the world, but yeah, okay. Um, cool. So tell me about this. Epilogue of epilogues. Cool. So there's a there's a little thing. There's the acknowledgments, and the acknowledgments are just the acknowledgments, and it ends with uh, the naughty list. People who scam or outright skip acknowledgement pages, please contact management for your free, all expenses paid pass to Christmas Land. And then you get a note on the type, um, and <laughs> it just like flows straight from some shit that you're like, why am I reading this? Into actually, it's an epilogue. Um, the book was set in a variant of Calson, a typeface designed in the 18th century by some guy, a guy who is a guy. <laughs> he is not related in any way to Paul Calson, Caslin, sorry, who went to Christmas land in 1968 and who escaped into the white with Millie Manx after the terrible Christmas Eve when Sugar Candy Mountain fell. After a long time of this time, Millie led him and two more kids, Francine Flynn and Howard Hitchcock, out of the static and into the pines. Um, so these four, four people four people yeah these four yeah. people uh leave christmas land but not because their ornaments get smashed uh they watched from uh, to never mind basically they uh they, the they escape they in the steal river, their right? ornaments oh some of the kids drown in the river don't they or is it just charlie max no charlie max drowns in the river and now we've come full circle on my time travel comment from before the spoilers okay yeah, no, these children uh, steal their ornaments and then they just, like, leave. Uh, and they're going to play Scissors for the Drifter or Bite the Smallest. <laughs> That's terrifying. Terrifying. I don't, I, no, I don't like this ending better. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Well, so it's it's not instead, it's just more. I don't like, um, no, but it's not, I liked it's it not better so hopeless. Ending. He, he apparently originally wrote an ending, uh, and he was like, it was super bleak, and he was like, I'm going to fucking stick to this ending. And then his mom was like, no. And he was like, okay. And we got this good ending instead. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bleak story all the way through. It's, so yeah, there's a lot of sad, sad people that have... Sad. Okay. Um... Oofed. You still rating this book a, a three out of five? 
Uh, what I'm able to skip over in this discussion, the parts that I was not super fond of, uh, and not be forced to read them, it does come across as a pretty good book. Um, I'd probably bump it to like a three and a half. Um, it's still out of my wheelhouse. There's still sections where you do have to like talk about Bing. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, maybe a three. Maybe I'm leaving it at a three, honestly. Like, it's very well written. There's a lot of cool stuff. I like the magic. I like the the way he does magic. Um, yeah, the soft magic universe stuff is really that I cool. I enjoy experiencing. Yeah, um, I understand that. I think the bit that concerns you the most is not so much the concerning part for me about Bing. Those are threats and stories that I hear all the time. Um, so I guess I'm a little bit desensitized to how like graphic that particular part of it is. I am. It's, it, it, it's, there's parts that are graphic. There's also parts that just like the way he's describing things are like a weird juxtaposition of like his childishness with like yeah, the things that are going on that make it much more unsettling. Yeah. I, I, I think that's it. Full stop. Yeah, I think that that's probably true. Like it does his, he's probably got a mental age of about twelve, where he's on the cusp of having like sexual realization and also like not really having the forethought and planning to do anything else. Um, which is a little bit terrifying that he doesn't like. There are no consequences. Um, but yeah, that bit. I don't know. That's pretty realistic um as far as i'm concerned i am way more scared of a guy who has no drive except to rescue children and to turn them into vampires that's fucking terrifying because he he's not getting anything out of that except more children but like (laughs) what yeah (laughs) yeah i mean his motivation is that more children i guess but it's really the car, because the car's a vampire. and Yes, he's sucking their life force know. out, which is really why he has the children. The children are a byproduct of the life force sucking, and he gets to live forever. But he lives in this perpetual cycle of stealing children so he can be younger. When does he get to live? Yeah. Truly live. His only drive is to get your children. Yeah. Also vengeance, I like, he gets a little bit of that. Yeah, but that's only from the Victoria McQueen part of it. I, I mean, and also on yeah, his ex wife. Just the one um, time. Eh, I mean, it's, I think it's the second Sorry. time. He stole the his children times. from his wife. He gets wife. the two bits of vengeance. Yeah. Because she said he, he was like a vampire. Yeah, and so he made his number plate Nosferatu. And so, you know. Do you find it really odd that when you, like, Nosferatu, I would have spelled N-O-S-4-R-2, which is, like, everywhere that I've seen it written about. Like, the Wikipedia page is so, with an R. Here but you the go. book cover is um, an A. Yeah, so you're reading an American version of the book because he changed it for America because of how you pronounce Nosferatu. Okay. So, yeah, when, like, the UK version of it is Nosferatu. Because that's how they pronounce it. Well, cool, because that makes way more sense to me. Nosferatu. And I was like, why is there an A? Nosferatu. <laughs> it's Laviosa. <laughs> I mean, I would say it Nosfer A2, and that does not. It's that... Nos for a two. <laughs> so it has to be a small A, does it? That's for A2. It's, it's just a two. Radio? Cool. Americans are weird. I, this is weird. So I think... All right, you're, you're settling in a three and a half, four range? With your... Uh, def- definitely never said four. Uh. <laughs> I'm three and a half to four stars. I think it's well written. It's not kind of my, kind of my vibe, but I, I'll pay it. Um, yeah, three, three and a half... Three, three and a half. 
if okay. for people who like horror thriller, definitely this is probably a good example. It's still all right. Yeah. True, 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 true. All right, cool. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it up there then. Call an end to this incredibly long, probably unnecessarily long episode. We'll see how good yeah, I get it cutting I, down. This will be a, a, a craft of editing. Um, feel free to take as much from it as you need to. <laughs> I mean, that will take I'll probably take out a couple of the sidebars. That's fair. Plenty of nonsense mixed in. Mm. Truth. Maybe just also limit this the, bit right here. <laughs> limit the number of times that I say uh, I'm moving limping. promptly along. Limping gradually along. <laughs> limping in a direction that may be forward. Um, yeah. All that. Do you have any pluggables? You're allowed to say no and that you don't want anybody to contact you on social media. Uh, I don't have contactable social media. I don't Sweet. really have anything to plug. Cool. I think. Excellent. Mike plugged reading in general, that more people should do it, and that me making him read Artemis Fowl made him decide to start reading again. I can recommend reading. I can recommend video games are pretty, pretty cool, even for people who think they're for kids, which is kids. not a super common opinion. Yeah, I don't necessarily think they're for kids. I just uh, struggle with motion sickness, and it's incredibly frustrating. Also, I have terrible yes. reflexes in game. Just <laughs> that's a uh, yeah, that's a fun challenge. Yeah, I managed to make it all the way through Portal one time, and that's literally the only video game I've played. Uh, and a lot of Minecraft, but I have like a forty-minute limit, and then I can't play anymore. I'm Good. ill and can't okay. look at lights for the rest of the day. That's rough. Um, this, is, this is life. Okay, cool. So, um, I'm yeah, going to... <laughs> Nothing exciting there. <laughs> ah, yeah. Do 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 do